have a temperance message today. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit from what I had been teaching. We'll go back there at a, a latter date. But uh, I was really impressed uh, that I needed to teach something different. I call it a temperance message. I'm not sure how many of you used to get the old Sunday school uh, cards and Sunday school lessons um, from this one firm that uh, occasionally she, they would just drop in something that's totally different from what had been taught and they call it a temperance message. And I felt that there's a need for us to get into some subjects that pertain to being children of God, challenges that w won't be addressed by what I was sharing at that particular time. And so I'm going to insert this for the next few weeks and then I'll go back at that point in time. The title of the message today is going to be Keeping Your Heart and Mind. Keeping Your Heart and Mind. I was really blessed by it. And I'm sure you're going to be blessed today as well. Let's pray, Father God. We thank you for all who are in our hearing audience today. I thank you for the word that's forever settled in heaven. I ask that you'd activate your word. Take it from the realm of Logos to the realm of Rhema, that it might be tangible reality in the lives of those who are in the hearing audience. Give me supernatural recall of your word and no flesh my glory in your sight. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Amen. So for those who are in Zoom, I hope that you all tune in as well. But I think you'll be blessed. Certainly, this will be food for thought and material that will help you deal with the affairs of life that we all have to deal with, some cha the challenges that come as a result of living here in this fallen world. Again, the title of the message is Keeping Your Heart and Mind. Anxiety is an emotion that at one time or another grips each one of us. How many of y'all have gone through anxiety? Oh, Praise. It surfaces as the mo at the most import importune times. Have you ever had one of those days when you wake up in the morning, the birds sound cheerier, the sky seems to be bluer, maybe you haven't had it for a while, <laughs> and everything is well, you feel invigorated with new life. Praise the Lord. Then out of the nowhere, you receive news that your company is going to have a massive layoff, and that will include you, or the doctors report from your last physical rise in the, in the mail with some negative results. How many of y'all have gone through that and experienced that? The initial nature or natural response to those uh, situations is mental anguish and concern. You have just been dealt the poison pill of anxiety. Within seconds, you feel overwhelmed, and your mind becomes flooded with mental images depicting the situation that has just been presented to you, uh, you're going to be unemployed and unable to obtain another job, the first thing that comes to many of our minds. Foreclosure proceedings on your home and your family having to live in the streets or you're wasting away with some incurable disease in the hospital because of the report that you just heard. And as we get older, that's certainly uh, something we have to be concerned about that it can come upon us at any time, and we've got to stand our ground as children of God. The result of these images is the ingestion of the second poison pill, which is fear. So we have anxiety, and then we have the second pill, which is fear, which is insidious because it will attempt to infiltrate all the aspects of your life with a paranoia that stifles creativity and cripples all ambitions. Have you found that to be the case? I mean, you don't feel like doing anything. You're like, <laughs> I'm going to deal with this in my life. God, are you going to come and help me? You know, and uh, what impact is it going to have on the rest of those who are in my family? So what is the remedy? The remedy is found in the word of God, which tells us in Philippians 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, the following. Be careful in that in the New King James Version. Uh, it means uh, don't be anxious. Be careful. Be anxious for nothing. We're not supposed to be anxious about anything that will confront us in life. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. We're on number 7 now. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. How many of y'all need some peace? Definitely when this happens to you, you need some peace. When the poison pills have been dealt, we need the peace of God that passeth all understanding. That's what it says here. And the peace, look, that just in my heart. And then it's, it's in the script, too. <laughs> I didn't know that was the next thing coming up. Seventh chapter, Philippians 4 and 7, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, 
shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice here that uh, Paul is telling us that we're not, uh, we're not to be careful about anything. He says, and be careful for nothing, meaning that you are not to be uh, careful or anxious about anything, but rather you are to submit your concerns and definite requests to the Lord with thanksgiving. That's hard to do sometimes when you're hurting. It's hard to do when you just lost your job. But we have to do it anyway. That's the point I'm making. We need to know what the word of God says to do and do it regardless of how we feel. And so uh, we need to give the Lord thanksgiving, which means that you will be functioning in an attitude of confident expectation that God will respond to your petitions. One who trusts the Lord in anticipation of good will be responding in an attitude of thanksgiving even before physical evidence is manifest even before there's anything physical that indicates that the Lord has answered your prayer you're still going to have the, the attitude that would be expected from a child of God this is the reason you should be thanking God or thanking him in advance of receiving the answer to your petition the antidote for anxiety is continuous positive confession based upon the word of God, supplemented by formulating positive images of the desired results in your mind. So regardless of what you're going through, and some of us are going through terrible things, we still have to continually put in our minds the things, the end result that we want to receive from the hand of God. I'm not talking about science of mind. I'm referring to science of faith, which is described in Genesis, the 13th chapter, verse 15, when God said to the patriarch Abraham, who is referred to as the father of faith in Romans, the fourth chapter and the 11th verse, all the land you see. So the Lord's talking here to Abraham. He's sitting around and showing him all the land that he's going to give to his posterity. And notice this, he says, all the land you see, I will give it to you. If you ponder the magnitude of what the Lord said to him, or to Abraham, you will realize that God was not just referring to that which Abraham could see with his natural eyes. Because it's in another scripture, he described, in another scripture, he described what that totality of the land that he's going to see is far beyond our ability to focus and see. And so uh, the boundaries that the Lord was talking about here for the land that the Lord was going to give him and his posterity was going to be given based upon what he saw in his spirit. And because of the alternate verse that describes the land that he's going to uh, take control over and that's going to be part of his posterity, uh, extended all the way from the river of Egypt, which is the Nile River, uh, unto the great river, the Euphrates. We were talking about the Euphrates River this morning. In Genesis, the 15th chapter and 18th verse is where he describes the boundaries of that land which he's going to bless, uh, give those people who come out of his heritage. The shortest distance between these two rivers, the River Nile and the Euphrates River, is 1,000 miles. Y'all see? Y'all hear me? No one can see that distance. I don't know anybody can see 1,000 miles. Sometimes I have a hard time seeing five feet. <laughs> I wouldn't have had a problem at all with what the Lord had told us. Yeah, let alone 1,000 miles I'm supposed to comprehend in my mind all of this that God is going to give to my posterity and to me, uh, yeah, no, it was, he was not talking about our natural ability. Therefore, we must conclude that God was telling Abraham to see the land he was to inhabit with his spiritual eyes or to see it as an image in his mind prompted by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to have to do. We have to formulate a vision of God's promises and thanksgiving will come. So, we have to formulate in our mind, in our mind's eye, in our spirit man, in our inner man of what God is really saying, the, uh, the full feeling and the full uh, land, all of the, that's going to be enclosed by what he's asking us to believe. And sometimes the things that God asks us to believe are so fantastic, uh, we have to shake our faith and shake our feet and shake ourselves, you know, to really believe that the Lord is saying this is what we can receive as a result of having faith and confidence in him. If you're a professed believer who is trusting in uh, Christ Jesus, you are going to also be able to obtain the promises of God in a similar fashion that Abraham did. 
Apostle Paul encourages us in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter and the 5th verse, saying the following, casting down imaginations, the Greek word logis, logismus, logismus, meaning the computations and reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, watch this, uh, those things that we permit to take up residency in our minds to the obedience of Christ. We have to make sure the things we're thinking agrees with what Christ has said in his word. To the obedience of Christ, which is the word of God manifest in the flesh. So we have to believe what God said verse, versus what is said by this fallen world system. If you combine uh, this verse uh, that I just quoted to you in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, uh, which you're going to find that uh, there's more information that's given to us, how we master what's required to receive the full benefit that God has for us. Romans 10 and 8. The word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. We're supposed to be, I don't know, Paul said if we preach that, he said we should do the same thing. We need to reiterate what Paul had done, and he's demonstrating how we do it, and we need to demonstrate it even in our own lives. And so he said, the word is nigh thee, it's near you, even in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith, which we preach. You have the antidote to anxiety, which we mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, but a positive confession and mental imagery, but listen to this, are not sufficient to deal with fear. Fear is removed by perfect love. So I, and I've talked to people sometimes, they say, well, you know, I don't have what it takes to receive what God, you know, I, I have love and I, I have the mental imagery that I can draw a picture of it. Uh, and, uh, but those things I seem to have here, the mental imagery, the confession that I'm making with my mouth and all of that, I'm still not receiving what God says I'm supposed to have. And that's because you left out uh, a, a create a, 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 an ingredient that's important in all of us receiving, and that is perfect love. Notice it didn't just say love, it said perfect love, which comes from continued fellowship with God. The Apostle Paul declared in 1 John, the fourth chapter, 18 verse, there's no fear in love. So if you're still in fear, you're not in the love that the Lord is talking about, perfect love. You're not walking in the perfect love. And so we all know when we're still in fear, and we're going to have to cast it down and replace it with the perfect love that the Lord said we're supposed to have as believers. And so that comes from hearing the word and doing the word and being an obedient servant. And then you can have the love that's required. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has torment. Have you all noticed that to be the case? I mean, images of all kinds of things, as I mentioned in the very beginning, that probably will never come to fruition in your life. But we have to learn how to deal with them as a child of God. And what is the technique whereby we can cast them down and uh, remove them and replace them with what God said about us rather than circumstances and situations. And so uh, first, again, First John 4 and, eight, and 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So if you're fearing, you're not perfect in love. You need to ask the Lord to help you get position where you're operating in perfect love. And uh, he's talking about the agape love, the God kind of love. And so that's in, if our mindset is negative and based upon what people are doing to us and all of that and we have a hard time loving them, I have to look at, when I watch in the news, I always say, I love them anyway, but the, the God kind of love. And that's what you're going to have to do with your enemies. You're going to have to love them with the God kind of love so that when the situations come against you, uh, faith works by love. And so in the book of Galatians, I don't have that pen here, but in the book of Galatians, Paul says faith works by love. So that means that if you want your faith to work, you got to have love. If you don't have the God kind of love, perfect love, then your faith is not going to operate on, on the diseases and challenges and problems that are permitted to come in your life. And I want it to work. What about you? And I want to have an expectation it's going to work because, yeah, because I have perfect love. You know, I've dealt with some enemies on my job and problems in uh, uh, corporate America and all that. And, uh, yeah, those people who are behind it, I love them with the God kind of love. And I'm going to cast that thought out of my mind and allow that imagination to come and to cause me to have contrary thoughts about what the word of God has said is my results that I should be receiving as a child of God. 
Let's go to uh, St. John 15 and 10. If you keep my commandments, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We got to abide in his love. Let me read it again. If you keep my commandments, that's a tall order for a lot of people. They don't even read the Bible. They don't know what the commandments really are, truly. So if you're not studying the word, you really don't know what the commandments are. You have to study the word to know what the commands are. Ye shall abide in my love. And if you do that, then you're going to abide in his love. The first steps are study the word, meditate on the word. And you'll abide. Notice this doesn't mean in and out. You've got to uh, position yourself in the things of God and stay there. Abide means to live there. Make it your residence. And so that's what we have to do. When we find out what the word of God says. We need to make that our residence where we live regardless of what it is that's coming against us. Even as I have kept my father's. He said, just like I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So the Lord is saying the same way in which I'm obeying my father in my earthly sojourn. And you got a chance to see all the things that I've done as a human being in obedience to my father. You're going to have to do the same thing in obedience to my father too in order to receive the full bounty and benefits that he has set aside for you as a believer. So in the verse, the Lord Jesus laid down a pattern we should all emulate if we uh, desire to continuously abide in perfect love, which is to live a life obedient to God's commandments. We have to endeavor to do that. Not too many people do, do live in, uh, in accordance with the things of God. They don't take time to find out what the Lord is expecting from them because they don't study the word. You hear what I'm saying? And so if you don't go to church, you don't have any understanding. If you go to church on a regular basis, you get some presentation that will help you deal with the things of God. And if you additionally study the word, meditate on it at, the, at your home, at your place of, during lunchtime at, at your place of employment, then it becomes an integral part of you and you'll be able to call upon that word to assist you when the, the challenges of life confront you. Therefore, perfect love can only be obtained by continuously keeping God's word. When you walk with the Lord, you begin to assimilate his attributes and his demeanor. The Apostle Paul says, those who have fully aligned themselves with the Lord through the continuous renewal of their spirits have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 and 16b. So if you're continually uh, endeavoring to study God's word and to make it an integral part of your life, then you're keeping his commandments, praise the Lord. That's the first step, is to learn what his words say and endeavor to keep them in your life. Um, praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, have the mind of Christ. That's what we're supposed to have. Hence, the com composed resolve exhibited by Christ during his earth walk. That's why he came here, to show us how a person is to carry himself as a human being. Amidst the many trials that confronted him, said he did no sin and there was no guile found in his mouth. That's how they expressed the kind of lifestyle that he lived. The same thing, you should do no sin and there shouldn't be any guile, any lying, poison uh, in your lips, praise God, as a child of God. You certainly shouldn't be cussing. <laughs> Him can also be yours during your challenges. However, you will need to watch your confession and guard your mind and walk in love. For the Apostle Peter says the following in First Peter, uh, the third chapter, 1 Peter, first chapter, 13th verse. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought into you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you know, once, once the Lord is revealed to us as we go along studying, we we'll get a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And as a result of that, our hope will be increased, praise God, within our mind, our faith. And the grace of God that he makes available to us is going to be more bountiful in our lives if we're doing it God's way and not man's way. The verse also indicates that we are to be sober, which also means to be watchful. You've got to pay attention. And God will accept anything. No, he won't. When you cross certain lines, you need to tell the Lord, I'm sorry. You know, because you know, <laughs> it's going to be hard to believe that the Lord heard your prayer when you stand before him boldly asking him to come heal, deliver, and set free if you're not doing what he asked you to do. It's just like with my parents. 
especially uh, my mom. My dad died when I was about 12, um, almost 13. And uh, so my mom had to take care of the kids. About five of us, I think, left at that time. And uh, so I, I, I endeavored to keep her, her rules and regulations. Uh, and uh, as a result, I, I was blessed. But when I didn't do it, there was punishment that was associated with it. Same thing with the Lord. He has certain ways he wants us to adhere to. And if we don't, then it's real hard to ask him for anything. So I, I needed gas for my car, and I needed other money, too, to keep me going as a youngster. And so if I hadn't obeyed my parents, and I usually did. I washed the dishes. I cut the grass. I did all the chores that were assigned me. We had a list of chores for all the kids that are part of our family. And so I regularly got my full, uh, what do you call it? Allowance. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's she did. She'd write down what you have to do, and then at the end of the week, she put down what you get. How much money, you know? Back then, you know, a quarter went a long ways back when I was young. You guys probably need $25 or something. But <laughs> so it, it was good at that time. And so uh, uh, every week I got my full allowance. But my brother Ricky, <laughs> that's the Apostle Ricky Nutt. <laughs> He didn't always get his, and uh, my, my sister, Wani, she sometimes would get it, and uh, so uh, I, my, my brother, I don't think, he had a problem with sugar and a problem with washing the dishes, I think, and so in a timely fashion, and his mind, he forget he's supposed to do certain things <laughs> the moment he encountered it. So you got to make sure that you do keep the, the bidding of the Lord so you can have the faith that's required to receive from his hand. It's a little hard to go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy uh, and, and grace to help in a time of need if you haven't been doing what God has told you to do. You haven't been. Uh, the, you know, the assignments that he's given you that you're supposed to do, you've ignored it, forgot it, and uh, weeks go by, and it's still the same. At the end of every week, you never get your full pay because you're not doing the things of God in a faithful manner. So that's how we have to have an attitude that we're going to do the things that God has asked us to do with all of the strength and the energy that we have within us. So when we need him to come and assist us, then there's no doubt in our minds that he's going to answer our prayer and our petition. But if you haven't done the things of God the way that you should, the enemy will make sure that you're in doubt and you're in unbelief that you're going to receive from the hand of God. Because he was right there with you, watching you, while you did all those contrary things or didn't do what you were assigned to do. 1 Peter 1 and 13 Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind again. Be sober and hope to the end. Uh, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Christ. So as you study and, and, and the things of God are revealed, the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, his qualities and attributes mark the perfect one. And the perfect one is the Lord Jesus. Be like him. Assimilate his methods and manners. And uh, same thing for those apostles and who come after him. Uh, we're supposed to follow them. Those who through faith and patience embrace the promises of God. And you know people that even in your church that are living for God the way they should. You should uh, follow them. Emulate what they do so you can develop to the full stature of Christ. Verse also indicates that we are to be sober, which also means to be watchful. Continuously walking in fellowship with and obedience to the word of God. You now have the antidote to the poison twins, anxiety and fear. I want to reread re uh, our base scripture again before we move on to and examine uh, other information that's made available. Um, Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses six to seven again. Be careful for nothing. Don't be careful about anything or anxious about anything. But in everything, uh, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Seventh verse. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're living in a day in which satanic principalities and the powers are working double time to capture the heart and the minds of anyone that, that they can. A primary strategy in warfare is the concept of dividing and conquering, and meaning the separation of the one 
with whom you are engaged in war from the power source. That's a good uh, technique that the devil has picked up too in a lot of people. Divide and conquer. If you can't conquer an individual, divide. Yeah, the supports structure and the systems so that you can bring them, wear them down so that you can get the victory over them. According to the scripture, peace to the believers, power source, and peace has two, char uh, two charters, which are to keep. So peace is the power source. There we go. Uh, uh, to the things that God has set aside for us. If the enemy can effectively attack your peace, listen to me, he will be able to cut your, you off from the heart and the mind that peace offers in your life and the flows of God's blessings for your life. The word keep in the Greek is from the word which means to be a watcher in advance. We're supposed to watch in advance, anticipate what the enemy is trying to do when he comes against us. Um, to protect, to him in, to garrison. Garrison is a, means uh, is a stronghold, and peace is the sentinel. The sentinel is the one that watches in advance to make sure nothing sneaks up on us without us being wary and, and prepared to engage in. The early uh, warning system is the sentinel, which is peace, living in our lives, protecting us from the unsuspecting arsenals of the enemy. If Satan was disturbed, if he disturbs our peace, he has us distracted the sentinel responsible for guarding our hearts and mind, permitting him to sneak in his weaponry for the destruction of our hearts and our minds. When you watch any of these movies, you'll see how they sneak things in at night while you sleep and while you're not paying attention. And then they unveil it at the most inopportune times and will take you down if you're not ready and prepared. And his intention is to do it uh, undercover so that uh, when challenges come, you're not prepared to engage them. Since the, they are so important, uh, I would like to address the significance of both our heart and mind in respect to receiving the blessings of God. So first, we'll talk about the heart and its role. Let us examine the heart's role first. Solomon admonished us, saying, keep thy heart with all diligence. That means we have to work at it. Diligence means effort is expended. For out of it are the issues of life. The Amplified Version reads, out of it flows the springs of life. We want the springs of life to flow out of our heart. The New International Version says, for it is the wellspring of life. Our heart is. This implies that the enemy's ultimate goal is to keep the flow of the springs of life, which is the flow of the Holy Spirit uh, in your life. So the enemy does anything he can to stop us from keeping that in our lives. Our job is to be watchful and to make sure we retain everything that God has set aside for us uh, by the Holy Spirit in our lives. During Jesus' early sojourn, he had a conversation with a Samaritan woman uh, at Jacob's well in Sychar, asking her to draw some water for him to drink. When she hesitated because he, he, when she hesitated because he was a Jew and the two nationalities had no dealings with one another, Jesus said the following, whosoever drinketh of the water, this water shall thirst again. So he asked her for water from the well of Sychar. But whosoever drinketh the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. John, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 4. Jesus said that the waters that he would give would be resident in the person who drinks it and will become a wellspring of life. Jesus spoke uh, on another occasion uh, metaphorically about the heart as a source for the Holy Spirit, saying the following uh, uh, in John, the seventh chapter, verse 37 and 39. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture has said. Notice here he said, you got to believe on the Lord, but you got to do your believing based on what the scripture said. You, you got to study the Lord's commandments and you got to study his scripture. You, you can't believe on him properly if you haven't in, uh, enveloped what his word has said and then uh, endeavored to, to follow it to the letter. 
You see that? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, 39th verse. But this spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. At this point, they hadn't received the infilling of the Holy Spirit when he made this utterance in the 7th chapter of the book of John. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. The, the Holy Spirit came after Christ ascended on high. And he told us that we need to be baptized in the Spirit of God, not many days hence. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Glorification took place after he died on Calvary's cross and took his blood uh, to the mercy seat and smeared it and came back down. Praise God, and ministered for the 40 days that he was here in the earth realm. And they gave us instructions on how we to govern ourselves as believers. The word belly, that's in that verse there, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. You know, that word belly is out, uh, yeah, is the Greek word kolia. Some of y'all heard me talk about this. It's a hollow cavity. It's the womb, also called the matrix or the heart. It's where things are developed and future things are prepared to be unveiled here in the earth realm to become a tangible reality that you can get benefit out of. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Jesus said that the heart is our womb, and out of it uh, the rivers of living waters would flow. He then described the rivers of living waters as the Holy Spirit that would be resident in believers. He, the Holy Spirit is resident now in believers. Once you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives within you. Praise God. The implication is that the things of God contained in the ethereal realm are transferred to the earth realm via the matrix of the womb, your belly. The matrix or womb is the gateway, the line of demarcation between heaven and earth. Therefore, Satan and his cohorts will do whatever they can to block the gate, that block your heart that's filled with the Holy Spirit. In the natural realm, when the womb of a woman has obstructions that prevent the baby from being born, the pregnancy ends in a stillbirth, meaning the baby is aborted or born dead. If you permit your heart to be plugged with things that are contrary, listen to me, to God's plans and purposes, you will experience a stillbirth. And a lot of people have experienced stillbirth that are believers. Okay, the conditions that are necessary to bring it to fruition are not there. The conditions inside the womb has to be such that it will permit a child to grow and develop to the full stature that's required to be uh, allowed to come into the earth realm as a human being. That has all its traits and attributes intact. So uh, we need to think in those terms, the natural terms, and what does that mean in the spiritual? We have to make sure that we make sure that the womb uh, where the things of God are being developed is conducive to a place that can develop the things that God wants to manifest here in the earth realm as real tangible things. If you per permit your heart to be plugged with the things that are contrary to God's plans and purposes, you will experience a stillbirth. The promises and blessings of God will not reach, notice the earth realm, where you can utilize them. You see that? You have the potential, but you've done things that will make the matrix uh, not a conducive place for developing what God wants you to have in the earth. They will languish and die in the unseen realm. Observe that Jesus said, rivers of living waters, plural, um, would flow out of the believer receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, indicating that multiple streams, listen to this, multiple streams of living waters will flow out of the innermost beings of our womb, our heart. The Holy Spirit has plotted streams of blessings that will take us into areas that will baffle the mind. You know, out of your belly shall rivers, plural, of living waters. The Apostle Peter refers to this in the following in 1 Peter 4 and 10. As every man has uh, received the gift, even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice, it's not just the grace of God, manifold grace of God. We want to get the full benefit of what God has set aside for us, his intentions for us. I want the full measure to manifest in my life. What about you? In this verse, the Apostle Peter is referring to the believers ministering 
uh, under a supernatural spiritual endowment or miraculous power of the Holy Spirit because the word gift is derived from the Greek word charisma that you find in that verse, meaning a gift of supernatural ability. I want supernatural ability. What about you? The ministry referenced by uh, Apostle Peter is to be one that administers ministers the manifold grace of God. Look at manifold grace, not just grace, manifold grace. The phrase manifold grace of God refers to the many streams or rivers of living waters available to believers for them to experience God's favor and delight. The prophet Isaiah uh, described the demeanor of a child of God drinking water from the wells of salvation as a joyful experience saying the following in Isaiah 12, chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. It says, Behold, God is my salvation. Isn't that something? I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Verse 3, Isaiah 12 and 3. Therefore, with joy, this is the attitude that we should have of heart, Shall you or ye draw waters out of the wells of salvation? Isaiah's conviction is one that every believer should have, which is to trust and not to be afraid, and to confess that the Lord as his strength and song. Are you doing that? Isaiah's confession demonstrated he was operating in perfect love, which the apostle Paul uh, declared cast out all fear. The word salvation in the phrase, the wells of salvation, is from the Hebrew word uh, Yeshua, meaning deliverance, support, victory, prosperity, uh, heart, or health, and health. Therefore, the phrase wells of salvation means the things that as the wells of living water. Let me say it again. Therefore, the phrase wells of salvation means the same thing as the wells of water, of living waters. The implication is that while we are encountering life's challenges, praise the Lord, we need to maintain an excellent attitude, an attitude of joy in order for us to withdraw waters from the wells of salvation, the wells of living waters. So you know, our attitude is important in receiving it. All kinds of things come against you, but you still have to maintain your connection to the Lord and the kind of attitude that he expects for you to exhibit as a child of God. I mean, that's your individual responsibility. And when you go off the deep end, you have to ask the Lord to forgive you and get back in sync with what the scripture says about you. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, forgiveness is something that we all have to think about. You said the wrong thing, you did the wrong thing, ask the Lord to put you back on the straight path. Yeah. Put you back in the river that's going to take you to the bounty and benefit that he has associated with you for that particular situation or challenge that you're going through. You see, out of your belly shall fall rivers of living waters. And we were just talking about there's multiple streams there that are available. And we want to make sure we're on the right stream to get the full bounty that God has set aside for us. There's no one grace. There's a multitude of grace. Amen. Praise God. And so if you're set up uh, meditating on God's word, he'll take you through whatever path you need to go through to get to what he has set aside for you. That's why we need a word from the Lord every now and then. Spoken in due season. The Bible says, how good is it? And he's trying to put you on the right path. You know, and Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths, plural. Amen. I want the Lord to direct my path. You know, I may pick the wrong path. What about you? I want to get on the right path that leads to whatever bounty he has on the other end for me. Your path may not be the same as mine, because <laughs> you're a different person. But whatever the best path is for me to get to with the bounty and the benefits that God has, I want him to put me on that path. And I want to be an obedient child that follows his directive so I can get to what he has set aside for me. See, all paths don't lead to the same place. See, there's the benefits at the end of each of those paths, but it may be a different benefit. I want the best benefit he has set aside for me. See, that's why the Bible makes it clear that... Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, the reason why he comes to help us, he's our intercessor. You know not how to pray as you ought to, but the Holy Spirit with intercession makes intercession for you. Moans and groanings that 
unknown to those who are speaking the words. It cannot be under, uttered or understood. So it can be uttered and understood because if you take that chapter where it's talking about the Holy Spirit speaking for us, uh, it, it's an utterance. It's a sound that comes out of his mouth. It gives us direction and instruction. So I don't know how to pray as I should, but the Holy Spirit will intercede for me. So whatever path I'm supposed to be on, the Holy Spirit will direct me to the right path that's going to get me to the bounty that God has already set aside for me as a child of God. Y'all, you understand what I'm telling you? So we have to stay in sync with the Lord and in sync with the Holy Spirit. So as we pray, the Holy Spirit is giving us direction on where to go, what path to take. What path? And we have to ask, well, what path should I take here? There's multiple paths here. They all look good. Which one is the best one for me? And he'll give you direction. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Lead you and guide you into all truth. Whatsoever I have commanded you. That's why we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Whatever truth the Lord has for us, he's going to lead us in that path to get to where he wants you to go. Praise the Lord. Y'all understand what I'm telling you? <laughs> okay. I'm almost done here. Therefore, the phrase wells of salvation means the same thing as wells of living water. The implication is that while we are encountering life's challenges, we need to maintain an excellent attitude, an attitude of joy in order to, uh, for us to withdraw waters from the wells of salvation, the wells of living water is another way to translate that. During the life of uh, Isaac, the patriarch, there's a story, and I like this story, of the emissaries of Satan blocking it, Isaac's wells to prevent him from obtaining the blessing of the springs of living water. If we ponder these stories carefully, I believe we will receive insight into the tactics used by Satan to block the flow of the living water's blessing in our lives. The following are the background scriptures. Uh, I'm not sure if we get through all of this today, but I'll, I'll hit a portion of it. Genesis 26, chapter 26 and 6. It says, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. This is a story about him and his encounters with opposition uh, that pertain to the wells of living water. Genesis 26 and 12. Then Isaac sowed in the land. He sowed in the land. And received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Y'all understand that, right? Verse 13. And the Lord and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So he grew in the things of God, Isaac did, 14 verse. For he had possessions of flocks. Oh, that sounds good, huh? You got cattle here. Flocks and possessions of herds and great stores of servants. And the Philistines envied him. Let me just say this. My wife and I, we were talking about this. It came up this morning. You know, why people do bad things to you? There's no reason why they should be a hater. But they hate you because you're blessed. Amen. In fact, uh, y'all don't know who the person is, but I found there was a, there was a, a pastor that uh, I could tell he envied me because every time he, uh, he saw me, he said, you went brown again. Start calling me brown man because my clothes look good. I got some brown on now. But, and I, I told my wife, I said, that that's envy. I know I was dressed nice, but every time, why are you brown, brown all the time? But I said, well, you know, I have other colors too, but I, I like brown. And it's all matched. Anything wrong with it, he couldn't tell me what's wrong with it. But he started calling me brown man. That's a hater. See that? <laughs> then he saw, my, and he saw my cars and all that. He just, ah, oh, just, you could see it in him. He tried to cover me, he just couldn't. Let. I don't like this man because whatever he put his hands to do seemed to be blessed. You know, he knew other things that I associated with me. And he wanted me to help him with a few things, and I gave him a little help. But you'll have that. And that's what's happening here. With, uh, this, see, if we just pay attention, Isaac had a hater, a whole bunch of haters. And the Philistines <laughs> envied him. A better word would be hated him. <laughs> Did anything they could to make him less than what he was as a child of God. And you're a child of God. You're destined for blessing. And there are always going to be those people and associations and, and companies that want to do what they can to stop you from being a success because they're driven by the devil and the enemy's agenda. And so some of them may do it unwittingly. They don't even know they're doing that. Just understand the one who's behind the puppeteer, behind the curtain is Satan himself, pulling the strings to make them do things they shouldn't be doing. 
Let me 15 verse. It says, For all the wells which his fathers, they, they envied uh, Isaac. Because all the wells that his father's servant had dug, and servants of his father had dug these wells. In the days of Abraham, his father. The Philistines had stopped up. Why do you stop up a well? I mean, it's beneficial to everybody. See, they don't, see what we don't understand is they don't want you to have it, and they don't want it themselves. The fact you've got anything beneficial to you, they hate it. Because if you, if you gave it, if you want it, they wouldn't take it. And so this is a good example of what we run into ourselves in our natural lives. And especially when you get into management and things of that nature in some of these comp corporations, you find a lot of haters, a lot of people envying you. But sometimes it's even your boss <laughs> doing everything they can to stop you from being seen. I ran into a number of those. Yeah, put me in the back corner of a data center for a year or so. This guy, because I was skilled. I was smart. And I should have been promoted. He didn't want me to get promoted. He wanted me to be, stay out of sight. You stay and write this code. I don't know about you. I want you to come out here. Don't do no presentations or anything. You stay back here and just took care, take care of this programming that we give you. I was a programmer, but I was way more than a programmer. He didn't want anybody to see me. You know, but, but the Lord revealed me. Hallelujah. Couldn't stay here. I got a chance to open my mouth, and they heard, why is he back in there? He should be on the floor. We need people like him that can articulate what our products do. And so they, they found me and pulled me out of there. But uh, I, I think what happened, the guy who had held me back there for all that time, they had a, an advanced award they wanted to give, and uh, I had qualified for it. And uh, so the head the branch manager, actually the district manager, had a number of people that had been selected, and I was one of them. Uh, and then he said that you got to give him his reward, award in front of everybody. So it was probably 1,000 people there that day. So the guy who hated me had to give me an award a substantial award. It was almost thousand dollars I think they gave me, uh, and he had to come in and present it to me, and uh, ham it up so it sounds good, you know. <laughs> and my response was great. I hammed it up. <laughs> Thank you very much for the thousand dollar gift. I really appreciated that. And I thought he hated it that he had to come up there, because the head guy, who was our district manager, said, each one of those guys who are recipients of an award, you have to go. If they report to you, you have to come and do the presentation. You know how the Lord is? And then shortly after that, I got promoted to another position. Praise the Lord, where I could really thrive and do well. So the Lord knows what's going on. He'll, he'll position you, $1,000 stipend, and then promote you, give you a better manager. So just hang in there, okay? That wasn't that many years ago that this took place before I, w I quit and retired. For all the wells which his father's servants dig in the days of Abraham, his father, Philistines stopped up and filled him with dirt. 16 verse. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, this was the king during that, that time, the Philistine king, go from us, but thou art much mightier than we. You don't understand that? Go from us because you're smarter than us and you're more powerful than us. You got more insight than we have. We don't want y'all of you around here because you'll be coming up with these ideas. Don't be bringing no more ideas, creative ideas here. We're going to dock your pay for bringing this here. We don't, we're going to drink coffee every day. We're going to sit back and hang and waste time. And we don't want you telling what's really going on and what we can do better. We, we like it just like it is. It's been this way for 15 years, and you come in trying to change things. Do y'all understand it now? Okay. So it's nothing new, right? Double the same techies, technique, techniques, and methods are still being used today. 17 verse. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And uh, Isaac digged this 18 verse. Uh, again, the wells of water. The devil never gives up. Which they had dug, digged in the day. Let me read from the Amplified verse, uh, New King, uh, King James verse. So it may be a little cryptic. Uh, and Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Notice in multiple wells. And he called their names after the names which his father had called them. 19 verse. And uh, Isaac, and I'm going to stop just a little bit. I got about three or four verses left. And Isaac, his servant, digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. So they found another well. 
and uh, the herdsmen of Gerar, and he's in this new place here, close to where he left from, uh, did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. They didn't find it, they didn't dig it, but it's ours, it's theirs. The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Isaac because they strove with him. 21. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And they called the name of his Sitna. I'll take the name of some of these in a minute. 22. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And from that they strove, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of this third place where he dug a well, Rehoboth. Excuse me, Rehoboth. And he said, these words here. <laughs> for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So he looked at the 14th verse. The Lord had abundantly supplied Isaac with possessions of flocks, herds, and a great store of servants. Nevertheless, because the Lord's blessings were upon him, the latter part uh, of the verse says, the Philistines envied him. Notice that the scripture did not say the devil envied him, but rather the Philistines. If you want to blame it on the devil, no, the people have it in them. They don't have to have no devil. They've been, in, you know, they're part of the devil. They do things. That's what they do, a bad thing. Because they, uh, they've already, he's already stamped them. So they automatically do bad things because it's in them. They're not children of God. And we have those kinds of individuals that are associated with us everywhere. Everywhere you go, they have the enemy's uh, crew. And some of them, uh, unbeknownst to them, they don't even know that you're being led by the devil because they've been doing it for so long. The whole land is just covered with those kind of people. You know, I sit and I watch them. I say, look at these automatons. Like, how can I reach them and get them saved? I call them automatons. <laughs> and you have to be careful because, you, you, you know, you don't want to hate them. But you say, they don't do anything to make their lives better. They don't, do any, they don't even know about Jesus. They don't want to know about Jesus. And I, I sometimes wonder, how can you change that mindset so that they'll want to know about the Lord so things will be so much better for them? But uh, that's God's thing. That's not mine. So I just go along with the Lord. You love them. Praise God. If somebody crossed their path and caused them to get saved, make their lives better, uh, that's all I can do is teach the word. If they don't want to hear the word, then you don't want to have to soften their hearts so that they will receive the word and, and commit themselves to you as the Lord of their life and live the life that you have set aside for them. God bless you. I trust that you receive benefit from the lesson today. We'll continue with it next week. And I think it deals with the things that we need to hear and get instruction on it because we encounter it on a daily basis. God bless you. Go with God until next time. Yes, praise God. Now it's time for a prayer appeal. Those that are here today and whatever that you need from the hand of the Lord, uh, he's available to dispense it to you. Healing, wholeness, soundness, whatever. We saw that in Isaac's life, the Lord blessed him uh, in many ways, in many areas. He'll do the same thing for you. Uh, and so if you need uh, assistance and prayer uh, for a job, direction on your, on your job, healing in your physical body, praise God, peace uh, in your associations, whatever it might be. Because Ra came in because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And it has to do with all the bad things you encounter. I looked in the book and looked that word up, Ra, which is a Hebrew word, which means just bad. Anything bad falls in that category. Anything that's despicable, difficult, uh, all of that was ushered in as a result of the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. And you're still experiencing the results of Ra right now. Uh, anybody needs prayer for anything, uh, Raise your hand, if you would, and then uh, praise the Lord, we see you. Praise the Lord. Thank God. We're going to ask the ministers to come assist me here uh, for those who come. If anyone wants me to lay hands on them, I ask you to come forward, and we'll pray for you, or we'll just pray without doing that. So it's up to you. Come forward, and we'll lay hands. Let me put my mask back on because we're still COVID devils still lurking in the shadows. Yeah. Yeah, so we have to make room for this. It's just like during the time of Christ. He didn't always cover his mouth but uh, in his hands and things, but sometimes he did. Uh, and uh, other times he, I think, followed the 
He's in prison because a lot of times he didn't even know people touching the hem of his garment and other things that they did. He still prayed for the people because he loved that. But uh, people who had leprosy and things of that nature, we see a few cases where he prayed for them. But uh, most of those people, if they came in and somebody saw them with that condition, they'd be stoned right, at the, right on the spot. And so uh, we thank God for everybody that's here. Anyone else need prayer? Anyone who's not saved? You can come and receive Jesus as the Lord of your life. And he'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those in the audience, just point your hands this way, we'll pray. Guess I need to get my mic. Oh, I have my mic on. <laughs> what do you need, my baby? Ba- my Oh, that's right. Let's pray. Uh, Vicki, who uh, friends of our family from way back, uh, lost her mother. And uh, we need to pray for her that uh, she'll be strengthened with might so she can go and uh, see her mother at different funerals that are being handled and, ha- and occurring in various places, some of which they have to fly to to get there. So let's pray that the peace of God will be with her. Father, Lord, we thank you for Vicki. We ask that you would bless her, Lord God, and her family. Despite the loss of her mother, strengthen her with might by your spirit and inward man. If you need be, bring her closer to you, that she might embrace you as the Lord of her life and begin to live for you the way that she should. You said it's once appointed to man, and after this, the judgment. So let her know in her heart that uh, every one of us has to follow that path. You know, it's once appointed to man to die. And then we have to go and stand before Jesus. Touch her, encourage her, strengthen her with might. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. How do you, what do you need, sis? Healing in my body. Couldn't sleep at night a few days. Uh, what? Can't turn around. Okay. Father, I'll be thinking for our sister here. She's asking for all the bounty you have available. Supernatural power to flow through her. Yeah. From the top of her head to the soles of her feet. She's seen you do things in the past, Lord God. Even in her own family. She just simply came to visit here. And got saved, Lord God. The same salvation power and ability. We ask you, Lord, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Touch her legs, Lord God, and every part of her body that's aching and hurting. Let Zoe, the life of God, flow. Zoe, flow, 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 flow. Life of God, flow. Living waters flow, 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 touch her physical body. No, you're not at your body, is not your own, which you bought with a price. Christ died on Calvary's cross to release Zoe, the life of God, living waters to flow through her, to bring her back to what she's supposed to be, Lord. Everything working the way that it should work. Lord God, heal, strengthen her. Children her, Lord God. She's trusted in you, relied upon you, taught her kids about you, directed the family. You said, do not forget our works of righteousness that we've done for the kingdom of God. Nice for a full manifestation of healing. Part of the flow. Let her know you haven't forgot. You never forget. Heal, deliver, set free. Take away all of the maladies that are in her body. Yes, Make her whole yes. and strong. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord. Bless and deliver. Amen. And amen. Thank you for coming, sis. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How are you doing? You hang in there. Don't give up on God. He had not given up on you. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? I just pray a general prayer. Father God, for all that are here today, touch them, Lord God. Release your power, your ability, the rivers of living waters flow, Lord God. And on the rivers of living waters, let there be a blessing of healing and deliverance. Whatever it is going to supply their needs, Lord God, send it on the appropriate river and let them see your bounty and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, 
you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.